Hey, I'm Cedric Chambers, and I would like to welcome you to another episode of the 3D Podcast, a masterclass where we share with you everything you need to know about how to transform diversity and inclusion in your organization as well as in your community. We're on a mission to amplify the voices of leaders that are making an impact in the world today so that we can have a better tomorrow. Our goal every episode is to keep it simple, honest, and transparent with you by uncovering the truths in diversity and inclusion with the hope of creating behavioral change all while presenting it from a unique perspective. So look, if you're ready, get your notepad out, pour you a drink, and let's dive deep as we discuss the dimensions of diversity. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of 3D Podcast, where we speak to real practitioners that are making real change in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space. I'm excited for our show today as we're speaking to Daryl Adams. Daryl is the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for Hill and Notes and Strategies, an international public relations company. Daryl strives daily to create a culture where teammates are able to leverage their abilities, perspectives, styles, and ideas while understanding and maximizing on differences. It is his goal to continuously foster environments where teammates can be engaged in the work they do and able to be their authentic selves and organically innovate. Look, I'm excited. I hope you're excited. So without further ado, let's get to it. Hey, Daryl, how you doing today? I'm great. How are you? Man, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm blessed, highly favored, sitting on the right hand, all that good stuff. And so, <laughs> look, I'm, well, I'm I don't know about get sitting on the right hand, but I am blessed and highly favored. <laughs> there you go. There you go. No, the uh, I'm, I'm excited to get started here. So, you know, look, the, the way we like to approach these interviews to kind of kick it off is I really want to get some understanding and let the audience get some more understanding of your background, your journey to getting into kind of this space. Right. You know, when we think about, you know, D, D, E and I, and we think about a lot of people have different paths, different journeys to getting into this space. And so we're really one like to know more about your journey, your career, and then to add a little bit on to it. What are some of those things that as you've gone through your career that's really helped you navigate, really helped you catapult your career to the level that it is today? So I think for me, it actually started maybe pre-career. I've come from a family of people who are always fighting for equity and for equity of other people. My grandmother has participated in different like boards within the city, like with the housing authority and different things like that. And through that, she really, really pushed for equity of Black women and Black people. And then even like the experience of affirmative action allowed her to be one of the first Black women to break a barrier in the city that we came from and work at a place that there were no Black people working before she started working in the front office. So like I come from that kind of background of determination. And so as I started my career, like I went to school to be a teacher realized very quickly after being in schools a lot longer that there's a lot more politics than you do behind the scenes in the world of teaching. And for me, it was really more so about the impact of making a difference in students' lives. And so that said, all right, you got to figure out another way to do this. So I went into the corporate world with that background. And since then, I started a career in human resources. Like I found that humanity, people, They are like my care for them and like my care to create spaces of equity has always existed. And I found out like in an organization, human resources deals with human capital. So that allowed me the opportunity. So I started off as a generalist. I spent like 60 percent of my time dealing with L&D work, so learning and development. And then the other 40 percent of my time as a generalist, I was doing like business partner work, dealing with employee relations and employees and that was a pivotal piece to like how I catapulted my career into the DNI space because in that role I had the opportunity to learn a lot about individual contributors and what they deal with frontline employees the people who make the least amount of money in the organization and like what are they dealing with what do they experience and you know what do they need to continue to be successful and for us to retain that talent the talent that we really want to keep and from there I had a great journey and moved into a lot more of the L&D leadership development and org development work so In that space, I built relationships with leaders from frontline supervisors, team leads, managers, all the way up to senior vice presidents and executives in the organization because 
I had some type of touch point with them, whether it was facilitating pieces of the leadership development training or was whether it was supporting my leader at the time who led those efforts. And so that gave me that piece that another piece to catapult, because now I know what people are experiencing in their everyday that are individual contributors, entry level employees. Now I know what leaders at all levels deal with the experience, who really is making decisions, who's really in change management processes. Like sometimes you think like, oh, my director is in the room. They're not. They're getting information disseminated to them as well. Sometimes the decision was made in the room with the executives, the board and some senior vice presidents. Not even your VP was there. He's learning and having to figure out how to do that process. That was something I didn't know prior to. And that really helped because when we did have a really unique opportunity to go into the world of DNI and our organization, it was a blank sheet of paper. It wasn't, it didn't exist. The organization was about 20 years old, well, 18 years old at the time. And many people in leadership have been there since prior to it being the company that I became a part of. So prior to that, it was another company that had merged with an, another company. So they were there pre-merger. So they were there while the company was 18 years old, they were 25 years in. So those people had never heard of DNI and the experience. So we had a blank sheet of paper and that along with me being able to understand human capital statistics and engagement survey results, like feedback is a gift. I've always been told that, like, that's something my mother taught me. Like, you know, as long as they're telling you the truth and they're not lying on you when they give you your feedback, it's a gift in, in there somewhere. It may not be something you want to hear at the moment, but it'll pop up when you go down that road again. And so we were doing an engagement survey year over year that gave us amazing feedback from the organization. We just weren't using all of it. And so I began to splice it down to here. What do white women under 30 have to say about how they're being managed, how they are getting opportunities, confidence and leadership, pay, benefits? What are black women over 50 in the organization saying? What are millennials saying? What are... I got to splice that down because that engagement survey has so much info in it. And through that, along with the other pieces of my journey, I was able to really catapult into the world of DNI because I was able to map out what the real return on investment of our organization going down that road and that journey outside of just the things you see when you do the research. It's, you know, six times more likely to be innovative, two times more likely to exceed or meet targets, like all of that stuff bottom line business. But then there's another piece to the legacy of what it means to have an organization that people find to be a great place to work. And that ties into that. Yeah. Long story Man. short, that's how I got here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I think, you know, one, you know your story. I'm going to tell you that right there. But just to kind of walk through and, and kind of see how you got to this point is it's always interesting. And that's one of the things that I did early in my career was I used to always ask people that question. Like, tell me about your career. Tell me kind of your journey, your path, right? Because I just always felt that there were things in everyone's journey that you could use, learnings that they figured out that you can use in your journey to be able to help you navigate, you know, through yours. And so as people listen to this, you know, please, please, please listen to Daryl's journey and understand, like, what could you use? What can you start thinking about differently? What are those things, right, that can really help you as you navigate through yours? And so, look, today, like, I'm excited for our conversation, right? I'm just going to be honest. Because like, I feel yeah, like too. there's some realness that's about to be displayed here today. But today, <laughs> right, we're, we're talking about authenticity, right? And, and more authenticity at work or even in life in, in some cases. And so really kind of where I want to start is I want to get a foundation, get some understanding of from your perspective, kind of your definition. What does being authentic mean to you? For me, being authentic is being very checked in and tapped into your spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional of yourself, understanding how you process those things, and then how do you then take the wholeness of you and display that to the world in a way that makes you feel comfortable in you and comfortable and confident in you. I think many times people express themselves authentic authentically and then they begin to think like, am I making other people uncomfortable? Well, that's not really your thing to worry about. That's their thing to determine based on who you are authentically, if they can partake and participate. But what you should be really focusing on is, are you comfortable being you 
and confident in exuding that in all spaces. There are parameters because there are rules, regulations, and processes that may say like, hey, I'm not going to be a cursing Christian in some environments. But over here where I don't have those parameters and rules, I'm going to be the fullness of who I am because there are no repercussions behind it. Like that's that's really how I define it. I, I love that definition. And so, so let me ask you this. I guess this is the piece, too. When we think about being our authentic selves, right, and, and really thinking about that confidence to be who you are, really understanding that piece of it. An interesting question I really have is, do you feel that people want to be authentic at work? And I'm asking this because in some cases, right, we, we kind of know the environment in which we're in sometimes, especially on the corporate side, to where it's almost like if, if I be too authentic who I am, then... If there might be in uh, consequences, right, that come from this, right? People might not view me the same way. You know, image might be a big thing to me. And so I'm curious, like, as people, like, thinking through these things, it's almost like I want to be myself, but then there could be consequences, so then I probably shouldn't be myself at work. Or, you know, I might need to send my representative to work, as I may say. Like, how do you feel that people are, like, thinking through that as they're going into these various different corporate environments? And do they really, do you think people really want to be themselves? And if so, what are those things that we think that are stopping them from doing that? Okay, so you said we were going to get real, right? You think you said, like, hey, <laughs> oh, we're ready. I, I feel like it's going to be some real things. So, and I shifted in my seat, which says a lot too. It means I'm really like tapped in. Um, Let's go for it. Let's go. So the first thing I want to do is I want to ask you, define people. Are we talking about everyone in the corporate environment? No, nah, we're we talking, talking about, about specific groups. We're talking about Blacks. We're talking about, you know, Hispanics. We're talking about the people that are really trying to make their spaces in a place to where it's not many of us. Right. And so we're talking about uh, that group. Okay. Because I'm going to say, because I was going to say, people-wise, there's a whole group of people who show up authentically <laughs> as themselves and they have no nothing to worry about because the system is theirs yep. to determine and to bring. Mm -hmm. Like, But then there, I think, to answer your question, in the spaces that I've been in, especially with being considered like unofficial HR, like they come to me to ask me questions to figure out, should I push it? Do I have safety? Like that type of thing. I think that... People who like or love what they're doing and the people that they do it with want to show up to work authentic authentically. I think that people who are just getting a paycheck or just doing a job and they know that this isn't something they're going to do long term. They want to do long term. I'm just here to be here, but I'm black and I'm here and I need you to respect me. Or I'm Hispanic and I'm here and I'm in this job because you play bilinguals really well. Like those are real things and people aren't necessarily in their career or in their niche. Those people don't care about being authentic. What they want is what a company's promise, benefits and pay. But those people who have said, like, I'm a, I went to school to be an accountant, I'm in finance and treasury, and I like or love the work that I'm doing. Yes, those people want to also not have to worry about adding another job. Like you talked about a representative and, you know, I know people who actually get paid for, you know, these same people who get paid to be representatives, Angela Bassett, Tyrese, Meryl Streep, Brad Pitt. They are actors. They get paid top dollar to read, study up on being a specific role or image for a part in order for it to be likable and work for the wholeness of the movie and for us to put our finances and time into watching. We don't get that kind of money when we show up to corporate America. First of all, there are inequities in our pay. Like we are not making the same pay that our white counterparts are. One. And then two, I think that, you know, there's definitely nothing added in of saying like you're being the black person we want you to be. So we're giving you an extra 10 percent. Now, there are maybe some corporate things that may happen where they're like, yeah, I like this kid and they're snazzy. Like that's different. But there's nothing in your pay that's for you code switching or showing up as your representative. So. I think that people don't want to have to do that, but I think that in some spaces it's necessary. Oh, man, you touched on so many things there. I'm um, trying to understand where to go here now. <laughs> and so 
I love how you differentiate it between people who are just getting a check. You know, that's probably not so. But when you love your job and you have a passion around it, you want to show up. And so this kind of also brings to this point of if I love my job, right, if I'm an employee, I love my job, I love what I do and I have that passion. But then I feel like that environment does not allow me to be myself, who I am. And then I start to participate in what we will call covering or passing. My question is, as an employee, and this is just to help leaders understand this, how does that then hurt my productivity and what I'm trying to do, the work that I'm trying to do? I think that it hurts it because you're not as engaged or enabled in the work that you're doing. Because when people are authentic, are authentically themselves, there is no, there like there's typically no cap on potential and opportunity and creativity. But if people are stifling themselves or they're doing certain things to appease the people who make decisions or those leaders or what they think may appease those leaders, because sometimes I found out that people are doing it and that leader is just as cool and down as I'll get out. You just They just needed to encounter someone who's not afraid to do them in front of them. And that's a whole nother thing. But I do believe that it, in many cases that that's the thing is like, if I'm in this role and I love what I do, I'm doing well at it, I could actually be doing a whole lot more and a whole lot better if I felt as though you valued me, you respected me, you supported me, and I had a sense of belonging here and I could just be myself. I would feel more engaged to show up. I would feel more able to do the work and I would feel more included in the process so that I feel like when people feel like they can see their impact in the whole picture or in the bottom line, because that's what the companies are worried about. They get a whole different kind of motivation and drive because they see the piece to the puzzle that they are. And that comes from leaders. That's who I'm speaking to right now. Those of you guys who are listening that are leaders, that comes from you understanding what inclusive leadership behaviors are, what they're like, and moving past your apprehension to risk to differences and leaning in. Don't always look for a similarity in someone that's reporting to you. Look at the differences that you have and learn about that and understand because sometimes when people have cognitive differences, how they approach problem solving and work could be the thing that was missing from doing something you guys were trying to do five years ago. Yeah, yeah. And so understanding the productivity side of that, I'm, I'm also interested when it comes to kind of the psychological health of the employee, right? The person, right? Because when you think about this, I mean, when you're not yourself, there's so many things that you're probably trying to cover there's so many things that you're probably thinking about inside your head that you either don't want to do or you don't want to, you know, be to this, to that. And when these things come up, right, that can distract you. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, what kind of toll does that take on the psychological health, right? I don't, you know, does that, you know, put you down on yourself, right? Do you start to get into like a defeatist mode? Like what have you seen or how do you think that affects from that perspective? So I think that it has a huge emotional impact, so huge that the Harvard Business Review did an entire article around the cost of code switching. So for leaders out there who are trying to understand and do more, that is a resource you can go read. I think it tells a lot. A lot of times when Harvard Business Journal actually does surveys and review, you know, Harvard speaks to Black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Korean. Like when you see Harvard, they want to know your opinion, you probably give it. So there's some good um, stats there. But it talks about just that there are downsides to the emotional and mental health impact of people having to continuously all day long worry about and filter through who they truly are and how they truly want to experience things. Like I think about Black women and the fact that they usually get their passion is typically termed as aggression. And so there become there's the care, the stereotype of the angry black woman and the biggest people who can break that are one black men and also white and black. Well, I'm sorry, white men and women. But I think that you have to think about like if some black women may have a situation where they are working on a project and their entire team is looking at something a one way and they're looking at it a different way and they know they're right. They know they're going to save costs. They know they're going to innovate the opportunity and simplify the process. 
everybody, every leader wants to see that kind of thing happen. <laughs> like, in no matter what part of the business you're in, simplify yep. the process, innovate the experience, cut costs. Um, and they could know they're doing all of those things. And if they don't carefully approach and talk through how they that ROI is going to benefit and be best for the organization, it won't go anywhere because if they, if that passion takes hold and is too big many times in many rooms, in many situations, that passion is not looked at as passion. It's looked at as aggression and as that black woman trying to force them into doing it her way. And that's not even the case because she gets from the very beginning this is a long stretch if in this room at times. So I think that there are those type of impacts that come up where they really have to carefully step through how they do just the smallest of things, just the smallest of things. And that's, that's a lot on people each day. And then you want exemplary work. You want everyone in a ranking rating. I hate ranking rating leaders out there. I hate it. Um, but in a ranking rating world, you want fours and fives. But you want them to do like multiple things and one not be themselves is that. Like, yeah. No. You made me think about something, right? And and you, you said a word and it just like immediately snapped me back. And so, look, I'm country and I, look, it is what it is, right? I'm from Georgia. And I'm not I'm from, from South Carolina. Look, I'm, from the, <laughs> I'm from the <laughs> South, South, the South. And so, you know, it is when I was growing up and I moved to Ohio for my first role after undergrad. And when I got to Ohio, I used to, I, I said this word, I didn't really, you know, make no uh, means of it. And I used to always say the word thing. And they would always ask me, are you saying thing? And in my head, I'm like, I said thing, you know what I just said, you understood what I just said, if you could repeat it and you can correct me. But it was like, oh, you have that Southern draw or, you know, this can, this is the, you know, the words that you're saying, how you say it, you have to talk slower, you have to pronunciate. And it was all these various different things, right, that you started to, I started to get when I was coming to that corporate world. And then, you know, I could see in some cases to where I could have somebody, let's just say from overseas to where, it could be just as tough to hear, understand, and we don't. I don't see those conversations happening at all around why they should change the way they talk, if they need to pronunciate their words and these things. And so now it had me to where I was coming into meetings and to where I'm coming in about content, but then I'm focusing so much on what I'm saying, how I'm saying it, and having to really, you know, go through kind of quote unquote what they used to call or what they still probably call executive presence. Right, which I think is a whole another thing. But to work through all of those things, right, it's almost like I'm focusing on what to say that I can't even say the information that I need to say and that I'm trying to get out, you know, through this process. And then that spirals, right? Because then, then you feel you just don't, you're not successful, you weren't successful at that particular uh, presentation, you know, all this other stuff kind of snowballs from there. And so, you know, it just made me think about that as you was going through that process and that answering that question. And so my next question is, as we, as we kind of move through, if a leader in their organization is starting to see or they've done some assessments, you understand that authenticity may be a huge portion or a huge thing in their organization that they need to address, right? It is something that's really holding them back from reaching that place that they want to get to as far as an inclusive culture. What do leaders need to do? in order to help those employees who don't feel they can be authentic get to that place? And then how do they, what do they need to do to shift the culture so that we can achieve this? So I think first, I always think in these situations when you're trying to be more inclusive, change, you know, the environment or, you know, even try to shift the mindset of employees is they need to assess themselves first. You know, self-assessment, understanding where you are. Are you conscious and aware of your bias? Are you just walking around with a lot of unconscious bias? That's not the start. People like to do that and say, I mean, that's not the start and finish. Unconscious bias is not because outside of just bias are stereotypes. There are real stereotypes out here in the world that we have mental shortcuts and put things through. Like I just had to catch myself the other day and we're being authentic. Like I'm 
there are things about me in this role I'm still growing in in working through my own stereotypes and bias. So I live very close to a gas station and I, you know, stop in to grab like a soda or grab things. And all the time I see the same people outside who are going to hit me up for a little change. And I was in the car on the phone with some people and I was just like, I'm going to a different one. I'm going to go down the street. I'll drive a little bit further. I'm just sick of them asking me for money. And I'm like, it's, I, 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 they see me, I see them. It's the same people. We the same people. <laughs> and I thought about it. Like, well, it might be hot at that gas station. Like they might make, I thought about it, like, maybe they don't move from that gas station because they make the most money there. Like I'm not knocking their hustle. And then I was like, okay, be quiet. I would go by DJ for short because I'm a junior. And I was like, okay, be be quiet, DJ. Check your privilege. You've never been in, in the experience of having to be out in front and ask people for money. And if you were in that, you wouldn't be above needing to ask for a handout. And so I think that's a self-reflection thing. So leaders need to go through some self-reflection. Then they need to really like engage the employees. That could be through employee resource groups, through focus groups, or through just asking and surveying of understanding like, and, and figure out what are the right questions to ask to understand if people are being authentic, if they feel they can be authentic, and if they feel like the environment is inclusive enough for them to do so. Once you've done that, if you're looking to make a change, you have to present those findings and the impact of those findings. I know from my organization, we kept saying innovation. We wanted to organically innovate. And we kept asking questions, why weren't we? And Some of that had to do with people weren't engaged and enabled and they didn't feel like they could show up and be as creative and throw creative things that we've never done before on the table because they felt like it would get shut down or they weren't coming to the table to give the idea. It was the same people that were at the table six years ago when the idea came up. And those things happen in organizations where leaders stay in roles and positions a very long time and then they don't invite others to the table. So I think those are things you can do. You want to, and then like, it's up to those leaders to then sustain those behaviors. Like they need to create heightened awareness. They need to call out the behaviors that they're doing successfully and call out the ones that are not successful and then shift and change, but then sustain because why ask and engage the employees if you're not going to do people know (laughs) it's a thing now. They're not so far removed. Organizations really need to know they're not so far removed. And as much as social media may be a place organizations may not want or understand, it's a growing space that is being utilized like never before. And people see what other companies are doing and they're going to come back and say, why are we not doing this? Why are my peers in this business or in this market or my friends out here waking up and their companies are checking all the boxes and I can't even get a box to check. As you think through the answers and I'm listening to you, I'm just like in my head, so many leaders, so many things just kind of pop through my head. I'm just like going through these situations and I'm like, this was wrong. I should, this should have got fixed there. They didn't do this right. All these things that are happening. Let me ask you this and and, and understanding now, okay, leaders, this, this is the focus that we need to have. So now we know that that focus is there. What would, what is that? What is it? Is it different when I know that as a leader, but then I'm dealing with it myself at the leadership level as it relates to having to cover, having to deal with this passing, right? Because I'm the only one sitting at the table. I know what should happen, but then I'm not saying those things. I'm not really speaking up, right? I can see the organization. What does that mean for leaders who know the right thing to do based off of what you say? Hey, these are the steps. They have that down. But then the environments that they're in is just so stringent. It's so it's tough to really get things moving forward. My question is, how do leaders work through those situations at the leadership level to really influence and impact the organization so that? You know, even if it is tough, even if people don't see things the way they see other leaders, let's say CEO doesn't see it the way you see it. And you're trying to help the leader understand that in order for us to move to this direction, this is what we need to do. How do you go have that conversation with that CEO to help them understand this is the direction we need to move and this is what we need to do to move there? Because a lot of DNI leaders can say, hey, I know that, but now I'm bumping my head against a leader who, where I feel I don't have any power, where I feel I don't have any influence. 
How would you help them that are bumping against that wall break through? I would suggest to any leader of color, two things. Somewhere along your leadership journey, you need to find a very senior white man and allow him to mentor you. Mm. Okay, you we should get real. That. We're about to get I real. I will now. say that to anyone. <laughs> I would say that to anyone who's trying to do any white men can make one phone call to a company, another company who's looking for a role. They're looking for a role. A white man who is your who is very connected or very senior in a company can call someone who else, someone else up here who's very senior, very connected at a company and say, Hey, I know Daryl. He was a talent here. He's not here anymore, but he's been doing this. Y'all need to get y'all need to meet with him. That then with that connection, sometimes you don't have to do an interview. They recruited on call. That leader may pick up the phone and say, hey, Kurt or Kevin or Sarah or someone gave me a call and said, I should talk to you about this role I have. That comes out of that power of building that kind of relationship and never burning that kind of bridge. I don't burn bridges with white men that are connected. I find a way to build uh, some type of some type of thing to get us across that bridge. <laughs> it may be a car, a horse, yep. a buggy. I don't know what it's <laughs> going to be. I might be having to pull you in a wagon. But yep. I'm not going to burn that bridge. You're connected. And there's. Uh, I know the power of a white man being a, a senior white man in organizations in the corporate world making a, a phone call. That's one thing. Two, as people of color move up the business world, the biggest thing they can do for themselves is build relationships internally and externally. Build a network, make it important because you need to be able to go to people and ask what are their companies doing and be able to take that info because it's a, it's shareable and bring it back in your study. But then you also need to build the relationships in house because when I did encounter moments of kickback or of maybe not necessarily getting the talk space I wanted or needing to really get something through to leaders what I had to do and what I approached was there are a few leaders that report directly to the CEO, even if it's not my leader. But there are other leaders that feel me. They understand. They know the impact. They get it and they want the same thing. So then I built the relationships where I don't have a barrier to saying to either them or their EA, like, hey, I need 15 to 20 minutes on such and such as calendar. I get in front of them. I say, hey, I want to present this. or I have presented this. I got kicked back. This, these are the optics. This is the ROI. If we don't do this, we will be responding. Like when you know you're right in something, you got to just put the story together the way you've learned or know that top leader, that top leader understands. And then you, their strength in numbers. Find allies in that work or allies in what you're trying to get accomplished. Read them in, have, give them an active participation in it so that they can have buy-in and then represent it. The last thing I'll say is, depending on where you are in your career as a person of color, you may have to, because if you are in a DE&I role, I will say you are a corporate activist. And sometimes activists have to take it for the team. We have to push it for the team. We have to speak up for the team, even though we know we literally may offend the CEO, the CPO, the CFO. We, we may have to update our LinkedIn and resume afterwards, <laughs> but if we are a Risk talent, if we yeah. are a talent, if we, there are moments where I knew like, hey, but what I did know is I'm talented. I have references and people that can speak about my talent and not just at this company, but outside in the work that I do in the community. And lastly, God's got me. Like you talked about being on the right hand side. I know that as well. So there have been moments where I know no one else that looks like me at this organization has this seat, this moment, this opportunity. And what you are talking about, the decision we're looking to make will impact everybody else at this organization that looks like me and others. So I got to speak up. I got to talk. I got to say, this isn't going to work. I have to say like, hey, we're doing the wrong thing. And there are people who are at that place in their career where they could walk out of a one role and like within a month or two be just as good. They have equity like those people of color who sit in those seats who know they'll be good if they push the envelope and something comes out that's not what they were looking for. Like they have to be willing to push it. 
listen to me right now. Hey, to everybody who's watching this, listening to this, whatever, reading this, y'all gonna have to cash out Daryl in a second. Because he, he, <laughs> he out here dropping gems, right? Look, I'm, look, when you started that off, I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting that one. No. I, so, like I said, I built my network. And one of the, some of the biggest connections I have are with some of the biggest companies out here who do surveys, reports, and, and stories on the DNI world. And so Deloitte is one of them. And I know like very periodic conversations with their North Texas inclusion uh, office, or, like the person who's over all of that for North Texas. And what I found out from them is that they're moving to like diversity and inclusion task force that are predominantly made up of white males who are allies and advocates and they're being they're changing the narrative because they're the ones in charge. And that is is the important piece to it. And that's why I say, like, as much as we may like, well, why would I need a, I want to know how black people make it. I want to like you can get black mentors as well throughout your career. I'm not stifling that. But what I am saying is necessary as a person of color. If you're moving up and you're moving through is you need to have that because one, you could make a difference in that person's life and they're a senior leader somewhere and they could shift for other people who look like you, you'll never meet just through that mentorship. But two, you're going to be able to really learn a few things and how to approach things. Cause I, I approach my mentorship. Like I'm not changing who I am. I just want to learn how to approach these things as who I am. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Right. Mentorship, sponsorship, get you somebody who can be in the room talking on your behalf. All of that, right? I, I love it. I love it. Look, so so look, this is the part I don't like, right? We're getting towards the end of this. And so I think to really kind of cap this off, right? Because I love the way that you're, you're going here, is let's imagine right now we're in a room and you have some black and brown talented individuals and they are just starting out their career and you've already seen what they're finna be against as it relates to companies and cultures and things like this. They may be in great situations, they may not be in great situations. What are you telling this room right now as it relates to being themselves as they navigate through their career? Give me that speech. That speech is know who you are. Mm -hmm. Be comfortable in it. Be Mm -hmm. confident in it. Be bold in it and find a way to put it into the work. Like that would be something I would tell someone like authentically. No, not everyone not everyone can handle me when I come in the room. It's yep. okay. Like all right. I used to do onboarding for all of our domestic for an entire the entire domestic process. So I met every single person in the US that started at the company. And I know sometimes I would yell like in the lobby in the morning. It's like, good morning. What's up, y'all? Like, come on. That's authentic to me. I, in the morning, that you see me going out there. I'm in the lobby like, hey, what's up? It's good to see you. Like, and yelling across. People come in. I'm speaking. I know you. You know me. Like, employees are my, those are my customers. So I'm going to have those relationships with them. I'm not afraid to do that. And I know some of those groups that I brought in that room and moments, I've stopped and said, I know you're trying to figure out if I'm really crazy or if you just really like the way this is going. It's okay. You'll figure it out. <laughs> One thing I'm not going to do is just like adjust to change. So people won't always be able to swallow or handle who you are because you are all things amazing. And on top of that, you have these labels that society or stereotypes or bias may have said you're less than amazing. So they're going to be one enamored, two surprised, and three, they're going to process it. It's okay. You don't have to change who you are. You just need to be confident in it and understand how to use that in that world and in the parameters of the rules, regulations, and processes. Because I like to wear short shorts and have my legs out in the summertime, but I'm not going to do that in the I work. There's a rule around certain things. But that is but what I can do is I show up very fashionably as me, like in the world of work. So there are things that you do in those parameters, but don't compromise or, or take back who you are. It's not necessary. Wellness is something that we should be looking and thinking about as a global population in a whole different way after what we've been through. And, you know, not being authentically you, not being tapped into you and checking into you. And this is outside of just the corporate world. If I'm leaving words with a group of black and brown people, I'm going to talk about like 
you as a person, like your well-being is important. And so tap into you, check into you, understand what's going on with you and process that. And if you do that, then showing up authentically in the work world and within those parameters, it won't be as hard as you think. But we need more people to say, like, I'm not compromising who I am for this role. So you got me. Yeah. Period. Big period. <laughs> oh, we done. We done. Look, if you're yeah. not ready, if you're not ready after that conversation, right, we need to check your post, right? We need to make sure you're still with us here. I just want to also say thank you to you and yeah. like the 3D podcast. I wish that this was happening as I started out in this realm. Like mm. I'm so big on not holding anything to myself. Like there's yeah. so much room for everyone. So I appreciate that you are perpetuating the um, narrative that there is space and room for everyone to learn, understand and do this work together. So like yep. kudos to you all oh, there thanks. for all you're doing. Like it's huge. I'm just trying to document. Really thanks. Thanks very much. I'm just trying to document. So look, this has been an amazing conversation. Uh, before we go, do you have any shout outs, any pardon words? Where can people find you? Where can they hear more about you, your ideas, your, your thoughts on this topic? All right. You guys can find me on LinkedIn as Daryl Adams Jr. If you find Daryl Adams and he works at BMW, that's my daddy. I mean, he <laughs> might need a few more people in his network, but I think he's Get on his way to retirement. Um, out. Outside of just the corporate world, uniquely enough, you all came my way, Cedric, and I'm a podcaster. So I will give you guys a heads up. I have a podcast around society and culture. I talk a lot about what I do in the work world because I believe in equity in the real world, but then also just about like the mental health and the experience of checking in with you. So like, come on that journey with me. Hey, Mr. DJ podcast. You can find it anywhere that you stream podcasts. Like, just know I'm a cursed Christian. So, but my mama listens, so she knows. No, that's awesome. No worry. Look, we're going to link the uh, your social media, all that stuff at the bottom as well as we're going to link the podcast in the description. So if y'all want to go and check out, go check out there. Go check out that podcast. Give them five stars. Give them some ratings, some comments. Make sure that you yes. go out and support <laughs> in every way possible. Well, look, awesome. That does it for us. I'm excited. Look, this has been a great conversation. Thanks, everyone, for listening. This has been another episode of 3D Podcast. This is Cedric. You've been listening to Daryl Adams. Diversity, inclusion, extraordinaire. We out. Awesome. Well, that does it for us. Thank you for joining us on another episode of the 3D Podcast. If you would like to connect on social media, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at Cedric Empowers. And if you have any questions you'd like me to read or answer on the show, or just want to know more about my thoughts around diversity and inclusion, entrepreneurship, or just overall business, you can text yes. I said text me. 770-285-0404. You'll receive content straight to your phone on a regular basis and you can message back and forth. Not a bot or an assistant. All responses come directly from me. But look, this has been a great episode. Until next week, this has been Cedric Chambers and you have been listening to the 3D Podcast. We out.